Welcome to the ADHD Women's Wellbeing Podcast. I'm Kate Moore Youssef, your host, and if you've arrived here, there must be a reason. I'm guessing you're curious to learn more about improving your well-being alongside ADHD, or maybe looking for some advice or guidance to feel healthier and calmer. So why start this podcast? I'm a well-being and lifestyle coach, EFT practitioner, mum to four kids, and I discovered my own ADHD alongside one of my daughters at the age of 40. And now, after supporting many other women just like me, and probably you, I feel there's a need for more emphasis on well-being and lifestyle help for women with ADHD. And through the podcast, I want to offer you new insights and perspectives to enable you to live your most fulfilled, calm and balanced life. So wherever you are on your ADHD journey, my aim is to support you in finding the awareness and the most aligned tools to enhance your well-being so you can make the most intentional mindset and lifestyle choices moving forwards. Ready to get started? Here's the episode. Hi everyone, welcome back to the ADHD Women's Wellbeing Podcast. And today's guest is Kristen Carter. You may have heard of her. She is on Instagram as I have ADHD and she has a fantastic podcast. And I am really, really excited to speak to Kristen because she is an ADHD expert and she spends her days coaching adults with ADHD in her highly successful coaching program, Focused. What else could it be called? I love that. And she actually spends her evenings as a mummy Uber. I love that because that is exactly what I do as well, driving her three boys around to the various activities. So the fact that we've managed to squeeze this in between all our kids and have an adult conversation is near miraculous. <laughs> It is. We deserve a medal. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, well, welcome. And I've been really looking forward to speaking to you, Kristen, because um, I think today's conversation is going to resonate with so many people. It resonates with me so much, and I'm constantly checking myself for this. And I think let's just go straight in. We're going to talk about perfectionism. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about how for some reason that will become clear throughout this conversation, perfectionism and ADHD seem to go hand in hand, especially with women, would you say? Yeah, I think it's across the board. Yeah, I think that um, women definitely struggle with it a lot, but in my coaching program, which is both men and women, men seem to struggle with it just as much as women. I think maybe we are more vocal and more, you know, relational about it and in, in bringing each other into our struggles. But um, I've coached many men on perfectionism as well. So I think it's really across the board with ADHDers. That's so interesting. So what would you say? Do they present differently the way perfectionism manifests for women and for men? What are the differences or are there any? I don't think so. I think that whatever we consider to be our work, is where perfectionism will show up a lot. Wherever we consider to be our primary relationships is where perfectionism can show up a lot. And there doesn't seem to be a big difference between the way that a man approaches his primary work and the things that hold him back regarding perfectionism. And even if a woman is staying at home, there's still so much perfectionism involved in the home, the cooking, the cleaning, all of the huge amount of tasks that go into being like the primary parent at home. So yeah, I don't really think there's a big difference at all. Perfectionism is insidious. It kind of gets its talons around us. And I think untangling from it is really, really important in order for us to move forward and reach our potential. Yeah, that's really beautifully described because it is, it's so enmeshed, isn't it, in so many different parts of our life. And I'm so interested in this subject because I definitely see it in myself and I see it in my clients as well, but I can also see it in different people I know. And I just wonder, I know that you don't have to have ADHD to relate to being a perfectionist, but what does, I mean, this is like a podcast all about women's well-being. What do you see perfectionism do to our mental health, to our well-being? How does it give it a knock? And why is it so important for us to kind of untangle ourselves from perfectionism? That is a great question. So let's start with a definition. 
let's really define what perfectionism is. So the way I like to define perfectionism is holding yourself to unrealistically high standards and then beating yourself up when you inevitably do not meet those standards. So it's setting the bar too high, setting it you know higher than is possible, and then when you inevitably are not able to reach that goal or reach that bar or you know meet those expectations that you have of yourself, then there's so much judgment and shame and beating yourself up. Mm. And so obviously we can then from a definition say, well, that will certainly impact our mental health. That will certainly impact the way that we feel every day. That will certainly impact the way that I approach a task. It will certainly impact my willingness to put myself out there and be vulnerable. And so this is why I think uh, perfectionism is one of the primary issues for adults with ADHD. It's not a symptom of ADHD. It's definitely not you know, a clinical symptom. However, Dr. Russell Ramsey in his book, Rethinking Adult ADHD, he talks about the research that he has done with adults with ADHD and perfectionism is the most commonly endorsed thought distortion mm. that adults with ADHD present with. So it's not a symptom, but it is a very common pattern of thinking. And so that means that it impacts us in various capacities throughout our day, throughout our goal planning, our setting and achieving the things that we want to do. And it affects us in different ways too. So there's actually two types of perfectionism and maybe you'll relate to this, Kate. There is, first of all, what Dr. Ramsey calls front end perfectionism, front end perfectionism. So that's the getting ready to get ready. That's that I need my desk to be clean before I can start my work. I need to feel better than I do right now before I can go for a run. I need to have a quiet, comfortable place before I can read this assignment. The library is full, so I'm not going to be able to get this done, right? It's like this getting ready to get ready. It's really essentially delaying the productive task. It's a delay tactic that our, our brain likes to present to us. Then there's the back end perfectionism, which is like over polishing. And I like to call it bedazzling. I don't know <laughs> if you're old enough to remember the, the bedazzler that was like advertised to us in the like the 80s and 90s. It was like, I'm definitely old enough. Magic, right? <laughs> Into this like sparkly, I don't know, jeweled thing. We, we like to bedazzle things and make it pretty and beautiful and and it's an effort to remove any um potential conflict any potential failure any potential not measuring up because as humans with adhd we've missed the mark so many times mm. we've done it wrong so many times and we remember how that feels we remember how our parents interacted with us when we didn't do it right. We remember what happened in school and how embarrassed we were when we were the ones that did it wrong. And so now as adults, we are trying to avoid those situations. We're trying to avoid doing it wrong. And we're really trying to just make it so, 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 so good that there's no potential for failure, which is not practical, right? Yeah. We're humans. There's going to be potential for failure at all times, anytime we're putting ourselves out there. And so what I find is that perfectionism is one of the biggest things that holds ADHDers back from taking action, from living a life that feels authentic to them, from setting and reaching their goals, from starting the business they want to start or asking out that person, you know, on a date that they want to go out with. Like there's so much perfectionism and really it's just fear in a tuxedo. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, we're just dressing it up and we're making it pretty, but really it's just fear. So we're calling it perfectionism, but really that's a, like a really cute word for, I'm just afraid. I don't want to feel. I love that. I love how you've peeled away all the different layers to really make anyone that's listening now resonate in some way. You've just given so many different um, ways to be able to see how it kind of shows up. 
And as you were explaining all of that, the first thing that kept coming to me was, it's so exhausting. It's just exhausting. It's so mentally draining. It's so taxing on our health, our nervous systems, our emotional well-being, our relationships, being a parent. So we're now operating on a tiny amount of patience and tolerance because we're giving so much of ourselves to this fear and this perfectionism and this procrastination and these what if situations and and I think that's what a lot of people underestimate with ADHD is the amount of mental tax or exhaustion that we have just thinking about all the things thinking about how we can present and how we can show up without failing and how we can like what you just said about um going for a run and all the conditions having to be right (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> We're going to sit down and start an assignment. I mean, I am so, I'm actually okay with walking, going out for a walk. But my son, he's not going to like me saying this, but he will like, he'll say, well, my running top's in the wash. And I'm like, well, run with a different top on. All these little things. And I do it if I know that I've got to sit down and actually do some writing. And I'll be like, well, I know I've got to go out soon or I've got my desk's a mess. And, and I'm thinking about all the things And so it is tiring. It's really tiring. And I want to be able to give this podcast a platform for people to be able to relate and resonate and feel like they are part of a safe community. But I also want them to know that there are options and we can, I don't know if we can unthink our way out of perfectionism, but we can reframe, can't we? And we can start teaching ourselves or unlearning certain thinking patterns that we've had to get to a point where we are not beholden, we're not being held hostage by the perfectionism. What options have we got if we recognise, if we're listening to this conversation right now and we're recognising ourselves in these different analogies, where do we begin? Because it feels like there's a lifetime's worth of mindset shifting that needs to go on. For sure. And that, I think, is a really important starting point is to say like, hey, this didn't just develop this week. So it's going to take longer than a week to kind of unravel it. And that's okay. I think that the first step is to just recognize what's happening. Like to really recognize, oh, this is perfectionism. So with your son, like, what about this? What about this? What about this? It's just a conversation of like, hey, what's really going on here? Do you actually want to go for a run? Or maybe you have a project at work and it's already a day late and you are tweaking it and you're rereading it and you are putting the finishing touches and you're telling yourself, I just need a little more time. I just need a little more time. I just need a little more time. Being able to pause and reflect and ask yourself, is this perfectionism? Am I just trying to protect myself from potential failure, because that's what the actions are doing, right? They're potential protection. So I'm feeling fear. And so my brain is going to into all of this protective action. So I need to read this report three times. I need to make sure that I have a colleague look at it before I turn it in. I need to make sure, you know, that I, you know, check it a million times, whatever. That's just protective behavior. So just recognizing like, oh, I think this might be perfectionism, right? And just like stopping, pausing for a quick second. What's really going on here? What's happening? I think also just understanding that it totally makes sense that we're perfectionists. What we like to do as ADHDers is notice that we're doing something that's not serving us. So maybe you notice perfectionism come up for you. But then what we love to do is to judge ourselves and beat ourselves up and go into a shame spiral. I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't believe I've been holding myself back for all these years. I can't believe that I'm letting, you know, this fear um, keep me from reaching my goals. And we just like layer on um, self-blame, self-judgment and shame. And so that's just drama on top of drama. So if perfectionism is drama, now we're layering judgment and shame, which is just more drama, which is, Spoiler alert, just going to hold us back from doing anything, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why so many ADHDers feel stuck 
so many ADHDers feel like they just can't take consistent action. So many ADHDers just feel like I'm never going to be able to reach my goals. And one of the reasons is when we notice that we're taking action that's not serving us, we judge ourselves instead yeah. of being kind, instead of being understanding. So just realizing like, of course, it makes sense that I'm a perfectionist. Of course, I've, I've been corrected since I was a toddler on how I'm doing everything wrong. So of course, as an adult, I'm going to be a perfectionist who tries not to do anything wrong because it didn't feel good back then and it doesn't feel good now, right? And so of course, I'm a perfectionist. If we can open up to that, if we can have some compassion and some acceptance of that, like this is not actually a bad thing. It's just something that's happening and it makes a lot of sense. Then there's like a, then there's space to say, okay, now what? But if you're judging and self-blaming and shaming yourself, there's no space, there's no room to say, okay, I think I'm being a perfectionist. What's really going on here, right? Because you're too busy in the loop of self-judgment. So I really think that just recognizing that, that it's normal, that as an adult with ADHD, if you're not a perfectionist, you're kind of in the minority, actually, because mm -hmm. most of us are. And if you can begin to recognize it and not judge yourself, but just notice it, then that will give you some options. So, you know, one thing I talk about with my clients is there might be some past trauma that you want to work with, with a therapist, work through, I mean, with a therapist, because some of our perfectionistic tendencies comes from trauma in our youth. And that might be worthwhile to work through that. Um, but a big, huge portion of this is separating our worth from our performance. We have these thoughts like, if I can do it well, then I'm worthy, then I'm lovable, then I'm value, valuable. But if I'm not performing well, then I'm unworthy. I'm, I don't add value to this family or to this company or to this friend group. And I'm, no one's going to accept me. No one's going to love me. And so separating our worthiness from our performance, that's really, really important. That is deep, deep, deep work. Yeah. And what you're saying then, I think highly interrelates with um, rejection sensitivity as well, is that we've mm -hmm. definitely had the criticism and we've had that feedback from a long time. And I, you know, when you were talking about having to double check and reread, and that was one of the reasons why I left, I used to work in PR. Mm -hmm. And, you know, working in PR is you have to make sure that the press release is written you know, every word to a T, if you leave out any detail or put in the wrong detail, it's awful. And you get that, you know, the client speaking to you, you get your director speaking to you. And I remember I used to reread, reread, and it got to a point where I was just constantly overwhelmed and stressed. Like I'd get home from work and I was just good for nothing. I should have been going out with my friends and partying and having fun. I was actually just so exhausted by my own internal perfectionism of just fear absolute fear yeah. that I was gonna someone was gonna say that wasn't right you wrote the wrong you know details and so it can it can just show up in so many different ways but when you said you know there's so many of us that feel like we're stuck and we never fulfilling our potential and we always believe that we've got more to offer but for you know it's like self-sabotage or we just can't quite get to that point it's, it's almost like we're being held in this like holding pen, this holding area of perfectionism where we can just about see what's the head of us. And then we're just held there because it's, whether it's like you say, the protection, the hypervigilance, the fear. But I love this very simple step of just, it's like almost like wrapping yourself in a bit of a bubble and just going, okay, what's this showing me? What's this telling me? Like, let's take a breather because we can do that. It just takes a bit of practice. Like when we feel that trigger just come up, we can just kind of like 90 seconds of just a bit of breathing, acknowledging what's going on, accepting that you've been triggered or someone said something or you've, you're doing something. And we can do a bit of backtracking 
and then recognize, okay, what's this telling me? So let's just say we go back to the analogy of starting a business or launching something in your business and that fear, I mean, trust me, I know, you know, when you're like about to launch a program or a workshop or something, Oh oh my God, I like double check and I reread and I send it to this person and then I just sit on it for ages and try and pretend it's not there because I now know what that is and that's me putting something out there that potentially someone might not buy someone might not be interested in there might be crickets and all these scenarios that I've conjured up in my head that may potentially happen it may happen then you know you know that's reality I think for us to kind of go around there and say, well, if we just do a bit of breathing and just kind of recognize what's going on, there is still a chance we're going to get criticized and there's going to be feedback we don't like. But how can we bring that into day to day life, but also protect our protect ourselves from feeling like we are in a very dangerous situation? Because ultimately, that's what it is. It's our fight or flight response kicking in. It's the sympathetic nervous system, all these things that, you know, historically as humans, we've protected ourselves from. And I love how perfectionism and you've just made that connection, perfectionism and fear, because it is, they like sort of dance together of just hand in hand. But we want to, we want to maintain good standards, don't we? And I think, you know, as you said, we do, we have high expectations. And I actually think that's good because as someone with ADHD, I think we can see the potential in ourselves. We can see that we have something a little bit different. We know those sparks, those ideas, you know, we have them, but very often we will have that spark, which we know has got some weight to it and we want to carry it through. So it's just, it's that fine line, isn't it, of recognizing our potential, but not putting so much expectation and weight to deliver it at like the most highest standard. I think it's really important for us to understand when we begin to develop this awareness that the being stuck and the being in the holding pattern is a self-protection, right? I don't want to put myself out there. Maybe this will fail. Maybe nobody will buy this, right? Like in, let's say in the example of business. But what that's actually doing is it's causing us to fail ahead of time. So instead of actually failing by putting my stuff out there and having crickets, which is potential, instead, I'm going to fail to get anybody to buy because I'm just not going to put it out there. I'm going to fail to launch this program because I'm just not going to put it out there. I'm going to fail to give myself the chance to reach my potential, right? And so what we're doing is our brains, like I said, this is so insidious because it does, it's just sneaky. Like our brains are like, no, 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 no. It's dangerous out there. Do not put it out there. You could die. (laughs) This would be terrible. Don't launch your course. You don't know what people are going to hate you. I can't believe, you know, like, I can't believe you're going to put yourself out there and nobody's going to buy it. And so what we do is we don't put it out there and then no one buys it. But only because we never put it out there. We never got to put it into the world and say, hey, does anybody want this? And then be able to get feedback. Some people will say yes. Some people will say no. We can figure out why the, the no's were no's. We can figure out why the yeses were yeses. We can take that back to our business and tweak it and make it even better. Put it out again. Hey, anybody want this? Some will say no. Some will say yes. We'll figure out why. We'll tweak it again. And we that's just the process of life. Mm -hmm. That's how we do life. That is how someone who is reaching their potential operates in life. They put themselves out there. They get feedback. They go back and tweak. Then they put themselves out there again. They get feedback. They go back and tweak. The thing is, we make the feedback mean something about our worthiness. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you do have a, a camera and a microphone inside my head at all times. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do only because like I know you because I am you. Yeah, yeah. Like I've lived it and I've coached so many people on this. It's it's so fascinating. So if we can bring this into the day to day, you you said something really interesting, like how do we protect ourselves from that kind of trauma response, that fight or flight? And I think at first, 
We just have to develop a willingness to experience that trauma response, which is not easy to do. The Does willingness. It feel good? To, no, I mean, it feels terrible. Nobody's going to say like, guys, trauma responses feel great. Like, I don't know what the big deal is, right? And I am someone who has um, trauma responses to certain things. And so my, I will get really hot. My um, my heart will pound, pound, pound. My mind will spin, spin, spin. And I'll feel floods of emotion all over me. It is so uncomfortable. I don't like it at all. But in order to be vulnerable and put my ideas out into the world, in order to show up on a podcast and have a conversation that hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people might listen to, I have to be willing to engage with that trauma response and to say like, okay, it's normal that you're feeling this fight or flight response right now. It's normal that your heart is pounding. It's okay. What our brains are programmed to do is to keep us safe. And so when we have that trauma response, our brain is screaming at us, run, run away, hide. And if you can, in your adult brain, in your executive brain, say, okay, I notice that I'm having a trauma response, but I'm not actually in danger, right? I'm, I'm about to go live on Instagram. There's not actually any danger. There's no lion that's going to come out of the bush and like hunt me down, right? There's no person, you know, lurking to harm me. It's really just my brain telling me like, this is not safe. This is not safe. This is not safe. And so if I can self-soothe, if I can lean into that trauma response, so it's, it's, it's not even a protection from it. It's a willingness to lean into it and say like, okay. This moment. Feeling this way makes sense. Of course, I'm freaking out right now. And again, you notice that that self talk is absent of judgment. Right? So, for decades, what I would tell myself is why are you feeling this way? You shouldn't be feeling this way. You're fine. Why are you feeling this way, Chris? You shouldn't be feeling this way. You're fine. Uh, which, by the way, wasn't helpful. But being able to say, oh, honey, what's going on? You scared? I totally get it. Yeah, this is scary. You're putting yourself out there on Instagram. You're going to go live. And who knows who's going to show up? Maybe no one will show up. And you're just going to pretend like people are there, even though nobody's there. Right? <laughs> like, that's okay. It makes sense that your heart's pounding. It makes sense that you're hot. So it's really a leaning in to that emotion and choosing between the potential of failing and by the way maybe succeeding or failing ahead of time by not doing it at all so i'm just interrupting today's podcast because i want to let you know about a brand new program that i'm relaunching towards the end of january 2024 and i've got a sign up page on my website right now i have to say this is probably one of my most exciting programs so far this is all about changing the energetics from within and changing our stories, releasing old blocks, old conditioning and creating a new future, visualizing a new way of being and really letting go of the things that have been holding us back. This is all about our spiritual growth, leaning into what feels right to us and not doing all the shoulds and the needs and the comparing and working on the internal dialogue and the stories and the words that we say to ourselves. But often we find it very difficult to get there. So in this program, it's going to be me holding you accountable, motivating you, giving you practical, but also spiritual and energetic ways of shifting the dials, changing the way we think and the stories that we tell ourselves and the words that we use it will be probably a 45 minute workshop every two weeks for about three or four months. So I'm going to be sort of hand holding you, helping you make decisions and choices that feel right and aligned with you. This is stepping into your most truthful, authentic version of you and changing this reality and really leaning into a different way of being now that you have more awareness. 
I really believe that this is something that I've been working on for, for many years and I can't wait to finally share some of the tips and the ways that I have helped change how I show up in the world because it's very different to how it was five years ago. I'm really going to be creating a community of people who are ready to step out of a mentality that feels like the world has been doing things to them and start taking action and charge from a place that feels good to you. And this is not about doing, this is about being, this is about feeling. So if you really don't align with this sort of action and goal setting and sort of new new year resolutions, this may be a much softer approach for you and really work with our neurodivergent minds. So head to my website, you're going to see on the homepage, a sign up page. If you just put your name and email address there, I promise you that when this is all live and I've got all the details, you guys are going to be the first people to get it. Now back to today's episode. I wonder if we can say to ourselves, well, actually, you're excited. You're passionate about this topic. You've done the research. You know what you're talking about. People are here to listen to you. This is your forte. And mm-hmm. it's okay to have nerves. But actually, what maybe you're feeling in your body is also excitement. So can you lean into the excitement and accept that there's going to be nerves? And then things kind of change a little bit. But that compassionate talk of leaning in and recognizing what's going on, acknowledging that you're putting yourself out out there. Because what you said about Instagram, and I've been there when you're there and you're like, hi everyone. And there's like one person. (laughs) And then you're thinking, please don't leave. Please don't leave. (laughs) But, and you have to kind of just like carry on. But that fear is the rejection. So you know, that fear is, please don't leave, because if you leave, that shows me that I'm boring, that I've got nothing interesting to say. But also the the fear of criticism as well, isn't it, is coming back and like someone leaving a comment or, and that's why social media breeds so much anxiety, you know, right now, because you don't have to be ADHD to feel that sensitivity. But I think what is very often with ADHD, which is why people talk about uh, rejection sensitivity dysphoria so much, is that we do feel very, very deeply. So something that it can be perceived as small that someone else may just brush off and just forget about, we hold on to that and we ruminate and we overthink mm-hmm. it. And it goes on sort of on a loop in a thought cycle and we lie in bed and we're like wide awake and we keep thinking about that one comment. Mm-hmm. But you know, I had a client the other day and she's been newly diagnosed with ADHD and she was talking to me and explaining all this stuff, very similar to what we're talking about, perfectionism and not wanting to put anything out there and not quite believing in herself and all of this. And I said to her, have you heard of RSD? And she's like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. So during our session, I pulled up article after article And I told her about, you know, experts working in this field and podcasts and webinars. And she was just like, her head was just blown away because all of a sudden there was an explanation. There was a reason, there was a neurological reason why this sensitivity has been there all her life and why she fears criticism and why the perfectionism is such a big part. So I think what I want to explain is that it can, we can dissipate it. We can make it kind of a bit of a smaller voice but we are probably going to have this propensity for it most of our lives. But that awareness that we talked about before and that acknowledgement and then the self-compassion of it rearing its head, showing up when we don't want it, when we're just about to push ourselves out of our comfort zone. And I was listening to someone talk today about comfort zones and he said he never wants to be in a comfort zone. He said, you know, he was, you must be borderline ADHD because he was talking about he always wants to keep pushing forwards. Like he knows his potential. And so for him to be in a comfort zone is his, is he's out of his comfort zone because he wants to be learning. He's curious. And if he's not trying new things, and I feel that so many of us probably can relate to that because we're never going to stay doing the same thing. We're always going to evolve. We're going to grow. We're going to learn. We're going to be curious. So this uncomfortable feeling is probably going to stay with us all our lives unless we choose to just, I don't know, stay in, in one place, which I don't think is comfortable for us. So perhaps 
we're going to have to just accept this is going to be a partner in life and we can have a good relationship with that partner and have a bit of fun and laugh and smile mm -hmm. and maybe have a bit of do a, you know cry or this can be like the partner that we're always bickering with and we're always shouting at and I think it's a choice that's so insightful because I think part of accepting who we are as ADHDers is accepting that perfectionism is a part of this and rejection sensitivity as well. And so being able, again, going back to self-judgment, self-blame, shame, if we can, instead of all of that, just accept, like, of course I'm being a perfectionist, not a problem. I almost, okay, so I, um, within my program, I'm teaching a course on relationships right now. And I'm telling you the truth when I say three days before I launched this course within my membership, I almost burned the whole thing down. I went to my OBM and I was like, listen, I think I need to rewrite the workbook. Please pull it from the printer. Like, let's not have them print it. Like, I was just like in self-sabotage mode. And it was perfectionism. I was afraid. I'm like, I what if I do it wrong? What if I mess up? What if I mess them up? What if, what if they hate it? Right? Like these are clients that I love that I want to help. Um, it, it took me speaking with my online business manager who also happens to be a life coach, which is so convenient. And she was like, is it possible that you're being a perfectionist here? And it was like, I had no idea. Cause when it's you, it's so hard to have that awareness. I was like, I told her, I was like, let me go have a think and I will let you, I'll come back and let you know. And I did, I like did some journaling and some self-coaching and I was like, yeah, that's what's going on. This is just fear in a tuxedo. I'm just trying to bedazzle this course. It's good as it is. And guess what? I taught the first two classes and it is darn good. But like, I was ready to shut it all down because I was so afraid, honestly. I think that's so important. And then like, as we wrap up, I, I just want to say that like with rejection, you know, we could talk for hours about rejection, but one of the things that we do when we allow rejection to dictate our actions, when we feel that rejection so deeply, and then we spiral, we hold ourselves back, we don't put ourselves out there anymore, is we end up rejecting ourselves. So someone else's rejection when we take that on and we're using it against ourselves and we're ruminating on it and we're allowing it to dictate the action that we have and we're making ourselves even more perfectionistic because of this rejection, we end up rejecting ourselves. And that is just so painful, right? Because then we're not creating a safe place within our mind and body. We're not creating an open, accepting place within our mind and body. We're telling ourselves, I shouldn't have done that. I should have done it differently. I did it wrong. I'm the worst, whatever. You know, you fill in the blanks, whatever your inner critic says. And so if we can just decide, other people might reject me, but I'm not going to reject myself. That can be a really solid place to start to unravel perfectionism. So like, I'm going to create safety within me. No matter what happens out there, where I put my my product or my offering or even just like myself like i'm going to go to the grocery store and i'm going to just like wear clothes right and and other people might reject me but i'm not going to reject me i'm going to create safety within me that can be a really beautiful foundation for unraveling perfectionism yeah it's just tapping into learning our who our authentic self is and knowing who we really are and what you said about um, writing, journaling, I think this is such a great tip to leave everyone on because you unravel something going on in your head. You weren't quite sure. You put the phone down and you were like, right, I'm going to get back to you. Because I think especially with ADHD, we have so much noise going on and we are got so many different thoughts and so many things coming at us in different ways that writing stuff down for us is, is almost magic because we definitely get to the root. We get to the nitty gritty of what's going I on. I could not agree more. I think that's one of the most useful 
practices that we can implement. And and it doesn't even have to be consistent. And you can you can only do it when you're triggered. And that's totally fine. It will still make a huge difference because the thoughts in our brain just kind of like whiz by and it's really hard for us to capture what's actually going on. And so if we can ask ourselves, like I like to write at the top of the paper. So like the other day when I was when I was doing this with my relationships course, I was I wrote up the top of the paper, why do I think this needs to be reprinted? And then I just answered that. I just like asked my brain that question and I wrote down all of the answers. And it was like, well, I think this part's not that great. And that part, like I could probably rewrite and make it better. And as I kept thinking, no, but why, but why, but why, but why? I'm afraid that what I'm putting out there isn't good enough. And we finally get to it. Your brain does have so many answers, but we don't often ask our brain productive questions. Yeah. And I think, you know, sometimes our brains don't have all the answers. And very often when we write, it comes from the heart and it comes from the soul. And it just kind of goes to that place where, say, if we talk about Instagram, why don't I want to go live on Instagram today? I don't feel like it. I'm yeah. not fe- I don't feel like it. I don't feel like I really, I'm I'm not feeling very sociable today. I don't, I'm not feeling very vocal today. And also allowing that as well, just like saying, you know, today I've just got my period and I just don't feel like, and even though, you know, and with the, with regards to your program or anything like that, like what's going on for me right now, Mm, you know, this has happened and like life's been really busy and I'm just tired, like and it's okay to also have those lean into the energy and lean into the cycle of where you are and lean into what's going on in your life externally with kids and family and pressure and illnesses and especially what we've gone you know with covid that ex- so many external circumstances have been out of our control and very often we feel like we need to keep push push pushing but i think the writing often just brings out I'm just, you know, I'm just so tired. I'm so tired and I just need to rest. And yeah, sometimes and the rest could be the productive thing. Yes, exactly. And that I think would be like the best next question is like, okay, what do I need? Mm-hmm. Do I need to call a girlfriend and have a chat? Do I need to eat? Do I need to rest? Is there anything that I want to do in my business? Like I don't want to go on Instagram. Is there anything that I want to do? Is there anything that I'm willing to do? Like those questions can really produce some insight and some action that would serve you. And like rest is productive. Rest is getting something done. Rest is refueling and recharging and getting you ready to be in that flow state, you know, the next time that you sit down to work. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw that on your Instagram, you put a post about having um, a rest on was it on the floor with your white noise machine right here, I was right like behind. that sounds amazing <laughs> yes and you know it was so productive and I was able to continue my work I had a I had a list of deadlines that I still had to meet and I, my brain was it had left the building and so I just laid my coat down on my floor and I took a rest and it was so good and then I went for a walk and then I came back and then I said okay what absolutely needs to get done today like let's do the bare minimum person and that is really important how can I lower the bar for myself instead of raising the bar let's just lower the bar right like perfectionism is setting the bar too high inevitably not meeting it and then beating ourselves up can we lower the bar can we not hold ourselves to a fantasy standard, right? We, first of all, we are humans with human brains. We are not robots. We ebb, we flow, our energy ebbs and flows, our productivity ebbs and flows. We are humans and we have ADHD, right? And so understanding all of the symptoms and the executive function that goes into having ADHD and accepting that allows me to lower the bar. So for example, I'm not going to cook dinner every night. I've lowered the bar when it comes to feeding my family. There's a lot that I'm not doing that I used to think I have to do this. This is my job. This is my responsibility. And I'm just like, actually, no, I've lowered the bar. Now, in the things that are truly my gift, in the ways that I truly am meant to be here on the planet, I love to to raise the bar. In all the other stupid stuff, I lower that bar 
real love. Because we have limited capacity. This goes back to rest and energy. I want to be putting my time and energy into the things that I know I meant to do here on the planet. Coaching, podcast, um, that's pretty much it. Coaching and podcasts and being a mom to my kids, right? So dinner does not go on that list. And actually, I'm really terrible at it. Keeping my house clean, not on the list, right? Volunteering for all of the things at my kids' school, not on the list. And I used to beat myself up for that and be a perfectionist about that. And so one of the ways that I'm unraveling perfectionism in my own life is I am engaging with reality. What's actual reality here? I am a really good coach. I'm great at podcasting. I suck at dinner. I suck at the details of my business. I'm going to have someone else do that because I am not good at that. And frankly, I don't enjoy it. And anything that I don't enjoy, I am not good at. They go hand in hand, right? Well, I just lower that bar over and over and over. Um, and I think that's one of the most empowering things that an ADHD -er can do for themselves is recognize their gifting and put as much time and energy into the gifting as possible and then lower their the standards for everything else. And of course, like your kids need to eat. I understand that, right? But like, how are we going to solve this problem? Because I'm not the one that should be managing this. Right. So is it my partner? Do I hire someone? Do I ask, you know, my best friend to help? What, what's the solution? Because I'm not the solution. I used to think I was the solution. I'm actually a really mm -hmm. terrible solution to this problem. <laughs> we need a different solution. <laughs> it's so freeing to hear this. Mm -hmm. And I think that so many women who are listening here will just love your honesty and just and be so grateful for all the different examples that you've given because for whatever reason, so many of us seem to think we need to be good at everything and we need to be doing everything and we need to be acing everything. And the, that's where the perfectionism, but you know, the more of us put the hands up and say, I'm rubbish at this. I suck at that. I really enjoy that. So I'm just going to put all my energy in. And that's when we all like, we just drop the, the act. We get a bit more vulnerable we don't have to, you know, we're not living in the 1950s anymore. We don't have to be the person that puts, you know, the three course dinner on the table. So let's just lean into what we're good at and kind of, like you say, let's lower the bar of, of the stuff that we don't enjoy that hopefully we can outsource or delegate or just, um, you know, maybe teach our kids to do. <laughs> That's what I try to do. For sure. I love it. I absolutely agree. Oh, Kristen, it's been an absolute delight. Honestly, I've loved this conversation and I wish we could carry on. I'm racing a little bit this evening, but I just wanted to thank you because this is, um, I feel like we've only just scratched the surface. We may have to do a part two. Oh, um, I love but... that. <laughs> for sure. Thank you for having me. This was a joy. Yeah. Tell me and tell everyone where they can find you and where they can work with you and your podcast as well so um if you enjoy listening to me talk today you can um check out my podcast that i have adhd podcast and you if you like to be on instagram i am at i have adhd podcast and if you, this conversation about perfectionism resonated with you i actually have a free course on perfectionism so you can go to my website which is i have adhd.com slash perfect and grab that free course Amazing. That sounds brilliant. I'm definitely going to have a look at that. Kristen, thank you so much. And I hope to speak to you very soon. Thank you so much. So that's today's episode done. Did what we talk about resonate with you? I really hope you found some takeaways that may inspire you to make some small changes that enhance your daily life. And if you did find this episode insightful, please do consider sharing it. Knowledge and awareness is power, especially with ADHD. You can also head over to the show's Instagram page, which is ADHD Women's Wellbeing Pod, and join the community that's waiting for you there. And if this episode really did strike a chord, please do consider leaving us a review to enable more people who need to hear these conversations find the show. Thanks so much for joining me today and see you next time.